There we go. Now I can see that. Awesome. And it is two o'clock. Okay. So welcome back to another week of CIS 194. I do want to start with a reminder that tonight you need to submit something. If you haven't done so yet, submit something, anything, if you're a Cabrillo student, to Canvas. If I do not see anything submitted for you, I will have to drop you, at which point you'll have to email me to get reinstated. And it's just a whole nother mess. So tonight is when census is due. So if you haven't done absolutely anything for the class, but you've been watching, at the very, very least, please go under modules and complete the VTEA survey. I need to show proof that you are active in the course so if you are if, if you are just watching this now and realizing, holy moly, he's about to drop me, the answer is yes, I will be dropping you if you don't submit something. If you have submitted something, you're perfectly fine and don't need to worry. Otherwise, um, yeah, that is tonight. Tonight, Monday the 14th. Outside of that, we're going to continue going through our uh, three chapters a week with our usual lecture review, our net lab stuff, and our quiz. Nothing too crazy. Uh, we still have another, another two more modules of doing this, and then uh, things will change up a bit. So with that, let's get right to it. These three chapters are pretty basic. For example, if you have done some networking and you should have done some networking like CIS 81 or Network Essentials or something to do with networking, if you've done that before, this chapter is nothing but review. Uh, the following chapter will be a lot of basic functionality that we use all the time. Uh, and this one covers uh, some things like Hyper-V. So for the most part, this week's content is pretty much a breeze. If at any point, though, there is something that you want me to dig into further, please say so in the chat. As always, I have all the chats up from YouTube to Zoom to Discord. So if you have a question, ask away. Uh, so Windows 10, as with all the prior versions, support uh, basic networking. That's how they can connect with each other. And if you're on a Windows computer uh, watching this, you're already on a network. The Networking Sharing Center is kind of the way that you manage a small group of systems. Not You don't use that for a domain. You use that if you're at a, you know, if anything under 20, you can use that as a central point for configuring uh, what network you are part of. Uh, so here you can set things like IP addresses and setting up uh, dial-up VPN, that kind of stuff. Uh, the location, the network location awareness thing. When you know, when you jump into a new network, it'll ask you like, what what type of network is this? Is this a home? Is this a, a private public domain? That actually ties with the firewall. If you ever wondered why that thing shows up. And you have to select one, and then it and then it says, "Okay, uh, settings have taken effect." That's because it's applying firewall rules, and you can change the firewall rules for a domain or for a public for private. And whenever you jump to that network, those rules will apply. So just because you're on a home network and you choose, let's say, the public, uh, and then you wonder why things aren't showing up, well, it's probably because you selected public network, and that has the most uh, stringent rules in the firewall. You might want to change that to private or home. Uh, your network cards 
are your connections? Clients and services are those that it connects to like printer or uh, the internet, that kind of stuff. Uh, here you have all the various items that uh, the NIC card can use to connect. So for example, file and printer sharing, if that's enabled, you can share files and printers. Uh, you can do quality of service. Uh, you can do ver uh, TC or IPv4. There is another option for IPv6. They are included when you install Windows, they are there. You can turn them on or off as needed. A general rule of thumb, if you don't need it, turn it off. You have a series of protocols uh, that are listed. So like IPv4, IPv6, uh, link layer topologies, both mapper responder and LLDP. Again, if you're not using LLDP in a network, you should turn it off. Uh, if you're not using V4, you should turn that off. The network driver, if you are unfamiliar, and this is true of any driver, they are basically the translator between the hardware and the software. You should always install drivers from verified trusted sources. Never install stuff just blatantly from the internet. Uh, Version four is not so much the most popular networking protocol. V6 has really taken over. It hasn't taken over every single aspect of life, but there is quite a large usage of V6. The next couple of slides kind of go over how V4 works. Again, if you are completely unfamiliar with how uh, IP V4 addressing and V6 addressing works, you should take a networking class because uh, this stuff really goes over uh, broadly. So here's what IPv4 looks like. Uh, you have the old classes that we don't really use anymore. We use CIDR instead. Uh, the, uh, the loopback address 127.0.0.1. I used to have a, a background that said uh, there's no place like 127.0.0.1. You have your, uh, your addresses that don't route out, but you can use NAT, which again, if you are unfamiliar with these terms, you should take a networking course. But at this point, I assume you have taken a networking course, and so this is more refresher. You have your subnet masks which are much easier to handle with CIDR. I always had a hard time remembering the, uh, the classes. Much easier to do the CIDR notations. In every network that's connected to the internet or really any network that's connected to another network, you have to have a router to act as the intermediary. And uh, in that, that network, you need to have a default gateway whenever a packet is going to get out and it doesn't know where it's going to go. It always goes to the default gateway before knowing where to go next. It is possible to turn Windows into a router. I would not suggest it. That just sounds like a bad idea. Uh, having a a desktop operating system function as a router, that that just that just sounds bad. Uh, primarily because it's a desktop operating system, it's not going to be optimized to handle a large swath of packets and be able to process those quickly. But also because it's a desktop operating system, it's going to have more vulnerabilities than with something like uh, like Linux's um, under pfSense. Uh, in what case? I don't know. I would not. I guess in a, in a complete and utter emergency and there's just no other way and you need it. But I would, I would never suggest it upon anybody, including my enemies, to use Windows as a router.
we do use Windows for DNS. Uh, there's a lot of DNS servers, and actually, we'll get into the back end of DNS servers in the second eight weeks of this course. Uh, but DNS, we use it. If DNS isn't working, people complain that the internet isn't working. But it's really just the, the name resolution. A uh, big point is all operating systems, regardless of, uh, of what it is, they all start by looking at their host file to see if an entry for the server or the, the resource exists there. So if you are malicious, you want to target that file. You want to make edits to that file to redirect traffic. All modern operating systems have made it harder for a, a unauthorized application or user to make changes to this file. But note that if your machine is acting funny, but your DNS server is properly configured, it probably means that the host file has been messed with. Because it is always the first place any and all modern operating systems go to before they go and, and reach out to a DNS server on the network, before a packet is made to request where is google.com. They will always look at the host file. WINS is an old technology. I hope you don't have WINS on in your network unless you're running an old version of Windows. Otherwise, uh, turn that off. No need to run outdated protocols that provide backward compatibility and expose you to those, uh, to those vulnerabilities. You can configure IPv4 via uh, dynamic, which is by far the easiest. That way we don't have to touch every system. If it doesn't get an address dynamically, you'll get the IPPA address, the 169254. That's how you know it did not get an address from the DHCP server. That's always a, a trick question. So here you can set it up automatic, or you can configure it yourself. Now this list, whether you know networking or not, this is a good list to have. This is a good list to know. Knowing the commands that you can run in order to get information you need to troubleshoot. That is something that you guys should know. So, so far, uh, I would say slide 25 is a good note to have. 26 kind of shows you what you can do with IP config, but you can see this whole list if you went to like ss64.com um, or if you just did IP config and you did uh, slash help, you would see this stuff too. Uh, same with ping. So you can go to SS64 and see the full list of what you can do with ping and what each uh, flag means. Same with netstat. Use the command line to troubleshoot any problems. Uh, our always go to is ping. And then from there, see what, what's happening. Do we have an IP address? Can we ping? The default gateway, can we ping out to the world and you know, step by step working from the end device that the complaining user is on all the way out as far as we can on our network. IPv6, of course, is the improvement to v4. Used primarily out on major networks. Can also be used at home, should be used at home eventually v4 will finally die and it'll be just a v6 world you should know how v6 works and again uh, if you are unfamiliar please 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 do yourself a favor and take a networking course and even a, a basic networking course will be fine that'll that'll take care of covering how all this works because there's a lot more information that is not provided in, in this course because it, it kind of assumes you have that knowledge. 
Um, just again, a quick reminder of IPv6 um, terms. You have your link local unicast, your global unicast, your unique uh, local. We don't have broadcast in IPv6. We have multicasts and anycast. Torito is one of the ways that you can take uh, you can take V6 into a V4 network. There are two other main ways that you can take a uh, V6 network packet through a V4 network. Torito is one that Windows knows natively. The others you would have to add. Uh, just like V4, you can configure it statically or automatic or use scripts in order to configure. Automatic can be done by either the stateful automatic or the stateless automatic. And Windows can do local resolutions by using LLMNR. All things that are covered in networking classes, including my Wireshark class, where you actually see these packets in action. Just like a V4, the same uh, troubleshooting steps can be taken to find out what's happening on a, on a network and why a end device is not connecting. Um, I would not use Telnet. Telnet is an outdated and insecure protocol. I would not use that to test application. I would rather use ping or other tools. Now, file sharing is something that we're used to. Nowadays, we can just do it on the cloud, which provides actually a much more secure fashion to share files and be able to collaboratively be share files. But if you're sharing it uh, in a local network, file sharing is the way to go. You can share a public folder. Those folders are already available. You can just put files into those into those public folders and it will be instantly available to any on the network. You can enable passwords just in case. But just know that anything that is in the public folders in your Windows, that machine is automatically shared. You can also share any folder like you have in all other versions of Windows. You can do the share with, and you can uh, enable permissions if it's an FTFS, NTFS formatted system. So the, the way that you share hasn't necessarily changed. The place that you go to do it uh, now lies within that ribbon, but it used to easily be that you could just right click into properties and then be able to share uh, whatever folder you're looking at. There is advanced sharing, and this has been around since like Vista, of uh, uh, having more granular permissions on, as to who can do what. Here's the advanced, you click on permissions, you can choose what user can do what. So like this, uh, who can share the folder? What's the name of it? How many uh, connections can be, happen at the same time? Any comments, any permissions, et cetera, et cetera. Computer management will show you what shares are available and who has access to what. It's kind of neat. It's not um, that totally comprehensive, but under shared folders in computer management, that's where you can see what folder is being shared and how many people are connected to it and who's connected to it. Um, internet connectivity, the little thingy that tells you, uh, hey, I'm, it's connected. How, how is it connected? It could be cable, it could be DSL, it could be dial-up, it could be wireless. I still don't think it's a good idea to have Windows be a router. That is weird. 
but it is possible to tether a from Windows and make turn it into a, uh, a router and, and share a connection. I just, I would not, uh, I would not do it myself. I would do it for fun just to see, uh, like Mr. Farley said, of testing it out and see what, what it does. Uh, I wouldn't do it myself. Wireless, obviously, as long as you have a wireless card, you can uh, connect to a wireless network. No wireless card, no wireless network. You can create a wireless connection several ways from manually doing it, copying a profile through the command line, through group policy, and even Wi-Fi sense. You have all these options that you need to configure whether you're doing it uh, through the GUI or through the uh, command line. Uh, you should not use any network that is open. That is always bad. That's like saying secrets in a crowded room. That's not a good idea. Uh, also, don't use WEP as an encryption type. That has been defeated over and over again. Uh, you can use AES and WPA2, although WPA2 has been broken thanks to the, the crack vulnerability. WPA3 is supposed to be our current secure way to communicate, but that's not out yet. Here's the, uh, the Wi-Fi status that you see in Windows. Troubleshooting wireless, your best way to troubleshoot wireless is the same as wired. You start at the end user and work your way up. So doing things like, is the wireless card on? Is it on the right network? Does it have the right password? Does it have the right IP address? If everything checks out proper there, then you move on to see, is there any interference? Like, is this machine sitting next to a microwave or sitting next to another device that is emanating uh, a Wi-Fi signal that's interfering? And then move your way up to the access point and then through the network. Windows has a firewall. Please use it. It exists for a reason. Please do not just take it for granted. Please do not just leave it unconfigured. Actually make some changes to your firewall because Microsoft put a basic template there that you should modify as system admins. Just because the private, uh, the private profile exists does not mean it's automatically secure to go on a public network you should fine tune it because everybody knows what is in that private profile. So they know what is blocked and what isn't blocked and will use the things that, that are not blocked to get in. So yes, the firewall is enabled, but again, it's a default template. Please make sure that you make some changes to it. That is what it looks from the basic stance in control panel. But you really want to get into the advanced configuration that shows you more complex rules and shows you what's happening. That is the place you want to be. Again, you have your three main profiles that you can edit, the domain, private, and public. Uh, domain is obviously editable from the domain controller, not so much uh, locally. But you have some basic settings that you can change. IPsec is also here. If you just so happen to have a system with IPsec, you can use that to do the key exchange, the authentication method, and have that configured. All the rules are editable. You can edit them in the properties and you have quite the number of tabs that you can go into to edit. You can make new rules. There's a nice little wizard that'll help you. Uh, 
here's a, a quick little picture of that, of the actions that you can take. You can use IPsec to authenticate between two computers, kind of like a VPN tunnel. You can see what's happening by monitoring the rules and the connections uh, that happened, which is great. You should always audit before you set any rules. Uh, home group networks, those are local. Those are not connected out to the internet. Uh, those are useful when you have the 20 or less systems that are all sharing, kind of like, like a home network, really. Um, I do see some questions. So will we have access to the free education edition of Windows 10 and Windows Server throughout this class? Uh, through Google Cloud, you'll have access to Windows Server. And if you don't have access to Google Cloud, let me know and I can get you some credits. So you can use Windows Server on the cloud. Uh, backtrack to Wi-Fi, the difference between EAP and PSK are the encryption. EAP and PSK, uh, let me just go back to that slide, where did it go? Yeah, personal uh, enterprise, uh, well, EA, EAP and PSK are two ways to encrypt uh, traffic, so what what you're basically saying is we're going to use a WPA2 as the basis, and we're going to use either PSK or EAP to encrypt our traffic. PSK tends to be the one that is used more often than EAP. I believe with EAP, uh, you need to uh, have uh, like an 802.1 certificate. Um, a downloadable ISO, I do not have access to downloadable ISOs. But through uh, Google, I can get you access to machines on the cloud. So let me go to my Zoom folder. and I will convert this video. And then when that's done, I'll upload that. And we'll start on the next chapter. Oh, DreamSpark. Yeah, um, I have not received any access to DreamSpark to hand over.
Okay, so move, oops, move these to trash. Excellent, let's proceed. Chapter eight, user productivity tools. Uh, this chapter has a lot of the basic functionality that you use all the time. So uh, a lot of this will not be new news like the file explorer. Anybody who's used Windows at any point in time since 3.1 has been familiar with the file explorer and the things that you can do with Windows 10 giving you access to things like quick access, OneDrive, this PC, networking home group. Uh, you have the ribbon up top with a number of settings that you can use. The libraries came about so to simplify access, but I mean, Linux has had that for a while and so has Mac. You can edit them. Uh, search went from being in File Explorer to next to the, uh, the start button to now part of the, the uh, bar at the bottom. And you can now use an indexing service as long as a folder exists listed in the uh, in the indexing service. It will be uh, it will it'll search faster. Uh, like I said, search exists. You can use uh, that to search around stuff. But if you have it, if you have the folder added to this list, it'll be faster because it it will already know what's there. Uh, anything that's Microsoft related, like Word documents, can have their content searched. Basic file metadata is available, the usual stuff that you can use to search. Uh, OneDrive is Microsoft's answer to things like Dropbox and whatnot. Uh, I suggest Nextcloud as a more secure version because you can, you can either host it locally or host it yourself on the cloud provider and uh, not let others uh, see what you have. Because just like Dropbox, Microsoft can see the contents of OneDrive. The benefit is integrated to, uh, to the File Explorer, but a lot of products already have that integration when you install, so it's not necessarily something unique. As long as you have a Microsoft account, you can log into OneDrive from any Windows box and, and access stuff either through the web browser or through File Explorer, kind of like this. Um, I've had, I had some good performance with it. Uh, I'm, honestly, I'm curious for Proton. Uh, they're making their uh, Proton Drive later this year. I'm very curious to see how well that performs. Uh, the default place where OneDrive exists, at least uh, the folder that you use, is is in your user uh, 
your user profile. You can choose to sync automatically when you log in or uh, fetch files as needed. The web interface looks pretty much the same and does a lot of the stuff that you can do already. They haven't changed this much ever since they released it. Um, in OneDrive, you have access to Microsoft Office. So if you didn't buy the suite, you can pretty much access it uh, on, at least for most of the things that you use Office for. We have Nextcloud running on a, that's a pretty big, uh, pretty good monster there. Huh. I have it running on the cloud in a vault and it seems to be, seems to be just fine. Uh, managing files. You can do just as you can in File Explorer in OneDrive. You can share from OneDrive out to another email with a Microsoft account. Did you know you could print from Windows? I didn't either. Ha! You can do local printing, GASP. You can do printing on the network. Easy yes to do when you have it on a server. Then you don't have to worry about what machine is sharing and all that fun stuff. I, I prefer to use uh, a network printer over a shared printer from a computer because if that computer is off or not working or something, then uh, things don't work right. Your printer driver works exactly as your network driver. It's the, the translator between physical and hardware or physical and uh, software. Um, if you did not know, I did a little research on this. Uh, PCL, printer command language. This is a HP thing. Kind of like uh, DVD plus R is a Sony thing. PCL is an HP. Postscript is vendor neutral. So you should have better luck installing a PostScript driver if it's non-HP. And if it's an HP printer, you probably want to go with PCL. Most printers, printer drivers are now in the uh, Windows update. So you don't necessarily have to install from the site, but you can. Oh, I see a question. A driver is easier if you have a Windows print server with a USB printer or just dealing with distributing the network driver, the Ethernet jack on the back. Yeah, so I would go with the Ethernet jack on the back because as long as the printer itself is on, then any device can print to it. If you have a Windows uh, machine sharing the printer, then that machine has to be on and not like go to sleep or be off the network, because as soon as it is, then so does the printer. Whereas doing it by network, it's more independent. Um, so in, in server, you can, you can add printers to share amongst all the network. Um, if you don't have a server in place, uh, you can, most of the printer drivers you need are available in the Windows Store. You can do printer driver at uh, install installation through the command line if you want. That is possible. You can manage printers from uh, things like the MMC, or you can do it from the control panel. In devices and printers, you can do stuff for both. Here is the snap-in. 
So this is something that you would see more, more often than not on a Windows server. Here is a list of printers that are on our network. And here are the drivers. So when a, a computer joins the network or joins the domain, it would get, it would get instant access to all of these because through the domain, it would get the drivers and know what IP address and now no longer depend on the server to handle uh, printing. It goes, it can go straight to the, uh, the printer itself. If you need, if you have a complex printer, you might need to do some extra configurations. Like, is this thing going to do uh, uh, duplex printing? Can it do what trays it's supposed to pull from? You can do all those kinds of settings there, along with, hey, do we print immediately or do we wait until we have all our uh, the entire print job? Depends on the performance other standards that you have, like uh, the sharing security ports and the color management if we're dealing with a color printer. Most printers have no security. It's just anybody and everybody on the network can print to it. You can be a little more specific and say only this group of people can access this printer. So here we have a printer, an HP printer, where everyone can print. So that means as long as this printer is on and on the network, anybody can print and doesn't necessarily have to be credentialed, doesn't have to have a username password, they can print to it. That may not be good if you have a breach and somebody just wants to mess with you and print thousands of pages and use up all your ink for no good reason. Here are your default permissions. Again, these are things that everybody knows. So if you don't want yourself to be vulnerable, this is one of the things as a sysadmin you would fix. Um, with branch office, you can send a, a print job and it goes to a specific location. Like if you're uh, at a remote site uh, you know, in post pandemic world, you're at a remote site and you want to print something to your office, you can use branch office to print. Uh, of course, things we already know, you can manage your print job. Like raising priority or stopping one or um, trying to handle a, a jam, that kind of stuff. Um, Web browsers, I'm pretty much going to skip because uh, all this information is now outdated because Edge is going to die and it's just going to run off of a Chromium. So this is kind of a moot point, really. Um, yeah, this is kind of a moot point. Internet Explorer has died. Edge is about to die. And if you've ever used a browser, you kind of know what you're dealing with. Oh, I have some questions. The domain policy for printing only affects domain members. Yes, it does. Uh, what happens if someone brings a device onto the network and adds the printer address manually? Well, if the permissions are set to allow and they're, and on the printer, it, it's also set to just allow any connections to it, then it doesn't matter. It will automatically print. Even printers are not uh, are not just set and forget. Other questions? Other questions? I see you typing. 
Uh, yes, there, there are lots of enterprise-grade printers that will connect to a domain controller. It is, there are, um, yes, there are printers that have a GUI through the, like the web that will uh, authenticate themselves into the network and only print from whatever user is allowed to print. Uh, so it depends. You can add a printer as a regular user unless you turn it off in like security policy Uh, but yes, in a domain, you can remove that, that right. You also have to think about it from Microsoft standpoint, uh, adding a printer is probably something that's not a security issue. So I would not be surprised if in the default security policy, it allows domain users to add printers without domain credentials. It's kind of the same thing like uh, in a shared folder, uh, anyone can read and write. Well, maybe that shouldn't be the case, but that is the default. Exactly. So that printer, um, that printer did not have any proper security controls. That's why you were able to plug in your laptop and see all those printers on the network and be able to print without issue because they didn't have any security measures to them, either not configured or it didn't exist. Printed chicken, chicken, chicken PDF. That's hilarious. I like that. Let's stop the recording and make the video. Yeah, that's a network in need of an admin. That is absolutely correct. You know, and, and it's more of a nuisance, right? Because uh, most printers are dumb enough that that's pretty much all the damage you could do is waste the ink. But you're right that step one would be enable switch port security and step two set a VLAN. You could also have a, a printer that is smart enough to join the domain. I mean, yes, there are a number of ways that you can get a, go around doing this, even if the printer is not smart. But the main point of you should have something. Uh, only, only printer you couldn't get to use was the one that you had a code. Uh, if the code was a, a digit code, then you could probably use a, a brute forcer to figure that one out. Video done. Now to upload.
Module 3, Chapter 8, added to 194. No not made for kids. Next. Cool. Processing. So I can remove this and do our last chapter. Okay, last chapter of the week. Keep those questions and comments running. I love these little stories. Application support. Uh, most applications are written to interact with certain subsystems like 32-bit, 64-bit, Windows, Linux, Mac. There are application environments that you can do to restrict what a program can do. And any poorly written application uh, can create quite a headache for you and you can use uh, the application environments to save you from that headache, like virtualization. Um, any applications that are built for a 32-bit system are technically not supposed to run on a 64-bit system because they're not built to handle that architecture. Windows, of course, has built a way around that. And they were so brilliant to call it Windows on Windows 64 or WoW 64. Essentially what it does, it turns those 32-bit API calls into their equivalent 64-bit version to run. So in a way, it's kind of like a layered virtualization. And 16-bit is not supposed to run on a 64-bit unless you use something like a hypervisor to get around that. The .NET framework is something you have seen I'm sure you have in like updates and, and vulnerabilities. This has been around and a lot of people don't know what it is. It's just, all right, something more to add. Uh, but it is a commonly used application environment for Windows. There are a lot of versions of uh, .NET. So you might on your machine have a, have a various versions installed of .NET. Pretty annoying. The Windows Store. I don't know about you, but I do not use the Windows Store, well, especially because I'm not on a Windows machine. You can install some stuff through there. Uh, you can run old systems, old uh, software. But yeah, uh, in 64-bit, you should not be able to run DOS or, or anything 16-bit. What you will need to do is use another program to run it in a virtual instance, like NTVDM can run a DOS application. The registry. Oh my gosh, the registry. For the longest time, the registry was the underbelly of Windows. That should somebody add a key that doesn't belong or uh, rewrite a, a essential key in just a character off, all of Windows just collapses like a house of cards. In most cases, you will, you will never need to touch the registry. Um, you should know how it, how the structure of it and know that it is still very fragile to Windows. The Microsoft folks thought it was brilliant to take this, this essential database structure and put all the configurations into it. So registry has sections and each section has layers of data, they, those sections are called hives. 
kind of like a beehive. Within every hive, you have keys and values. Um, again, if you misconfigure a registry key, it can lead to Windows crashing. It's pretty funny. That's a pretty dumb. For example, you have the main uh, the main hives, classes root, current user, local machine, users, and current config. Uh, H key classes root has all the extensions. So <laughs> if you want to be evil and make a text file, try to open in like a browser, well, you would go into classes root and change what program opens a TXT file. I will let your imagination handle the rest in the realm of the evil department. Current user only loads when a user is logged in. H key local machine has all the settings for all the hardware and um, all software that is installed. That is all in here. H key users has all the users that exist in the system. Current config is the current configuration of the of local machine. So two of these hives are current in the sense of the machine is on and what users logged in. The other three are pretty uh, standard. Basically everything I just explained. Local machine, like I said, it is the biggest of the hives. Well, second biggest to uh, classes root, because if, if you have a lot of extensions, a lot of known extensions, then you're going to have a very large uh, hive in there. Otherwise, this is where you have the hardware, the software, and system stuff. You should always, when walking into the registry, you should always do a backup of the portion you're going to change. Because if things go south and Windows crashes, you can log in in safe mode correct the registry, and then you're back up running normally. Like I said, it is possible to completely cripple Windows from the registry. Reg edit has been the way that we can change things since the dawn of time, along with reg.exe being the command line twin. That's what it looks like. Hasn't really changed much. You can edit the registry to PowerShell. It has the capability to do so, but still carries the same underbelly. For a program that is uh, 32 or .NET, you can install it as an MSI, difference from uh, EXE. Uh, those are read by the Windows installer service, which is different from an executable. You can automate a, uh, an installer. You can add it to a sign-in script or add it to group policy to install. Here's the options that you can add for running a installer. Like I said, any MSI-based applications, you can add into group policy and send them out. So you can install uh, a program to a bunch of computers through the group policy, as long as you have an MSI file. I will say that is neat because I don't necessarily, if I have a room of 30 machines or if I have a, a company of 60, I don't want to touch all 60 devices, but if I can do it through group policy, sweet. Makes life much easier. Uh, you can use Windows Store to install apps. If you have the APPX file, you can sideload them into Windows. So here, instead of having the actual MSI file, you would uh, you would just say, "Hey, install these," and it would use Windows Store to do it. 
after side loading, it can install the packet through like something like in PowerShell with the add AppX packet or use uh, Microsoft Store for business, either way. You can run Office 365 in Windows, surprise, surprise. Uh, you can do package management. It's not the most useful thing because it, it's somewhat limited. Uh, it's gotten better, but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, use it. Of course, not every application will work in Windows, even if it's built to run. Uh, older apps may run, may not, and you can use the app compatibility in order to uh, run an old application, like running uh, you know, in an older version like 7 or Vista. or saying, hey, we're gonna run in a reduced color mode, basically creates a, a uh, mini VM, if you will, to run that application. Uh, the toolkit, I haven't had much success with the compatibility toolkit. I've had more failure than success, but it is an option. But its main goal is supposed to be here. Let me run this program. Let me see what it, where it works best and set those configurations so that it does. Um, it is possible to migrate if you're using uh, other tools like the standard user analyzer. Uh, next on the uh, item list is Hyper-V. Oh, uh, would you create this compatibility more similar to Docker? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I would compare those more or less to Docker. Although it, it would be more of a, a stripped down Docker. Uh, Hyper-V is another option where you can run a old OS and its application that you need to run within a VM. For the most part, you will see Hyper-V in businesses because VMware is more expensive. So I would suggest becoming familiar with, um, I would become familiar with using Hyper-V because you might see that more often than not than VMware in a, especially like a small uh, small business. Uh, it has gotten better to use Hyper-V. You can also use a virtual desktop to connect to another system. But I will say, Please, please, please never use RDP. RDP is vulnerable. It is exploitable. Do your best to avoid using RDP at all costs. If you have to use RDP, use it through a VPN or some other means, but do not use RDP to connect out to a, a machine on the internet. Please do not. App V is application virtualization. It'll basically run the, the application within a, a virtual machine, but you see only the application. This is more Docker-like. Uh, there is the remote desktop services that you can install in Windows Server in order to allow, allow uh, users to connect to it remotely. Again, do not, for heaven's sake, do not run RDP on your on uh, any internet facing systems. Please do not save yourself the embarrassment and the pain of getting breached. Use other other methods, other more secure methods. Uh, you could use remote app. 
comes with, with Azure. So if you're using Azure, you'll be dealing with remote app. Something like this will be a little more secure using remote desktop web access because you could secure the HTTPS connection better than you can an RDP. So again, you can configure that through the URL, through group policy, or based on email address, according to however you set up. And this is kind of the little uh, prompt that you would get when you set up a remote app to desktops. Any questions? This was fun. You guys had some good questions today. Okay, looks like we don't have any questions. Um, so as always, we have a lecture review, more NetLab stuff, and a quiz. And if you're stuck on anything, uh, ask away in the Discord channels. So that's where we are and we can help each other. So with that, I will start uh, creating this last video to upload to YouTube. I see you in, um, I see you. I see you on YouTube. Cool, I see no other questions. So uh, with that, I will set you free and we will see you again next week.